All right, so thanks uh, for everybody showing up to your uh, class. Um, even those who usually show up online, uh, we just have a little bit of more sort of a group activities towards the end of the, the bottom half of the lecture today. So um, sometimes it works online, but it's just a little nicer if uh, we're all kind of at, at tables together. So um, we are now in unit C, where the main focus in unit C is gonna be this reading by Kim and Lannon that uh, I think is the focus of the next lecture next week. Uh, but uh, in, in unit C, we're sort of focusing on uh, looking at these archetypes that I've been alluding to and generally building up more complex causal loop diagrams so that when we go into unit D, we'll be able to start building these uh, stock and flow diagrams that have a sufficient amount of complexity to be interesting. So, um, so let's just get some sort of practice at that, or like I said, to warm up, um, you know, in this kind of global warming example here. So this was an example that uh, I took off of, so Met Office is kind of like the Weather Channel in the UK, a lot of news in the UK today. And um, the, um, and the idea here is they're trying to communicate that there are positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks at play with global warming. So they've got global warming in the middle here. They say it creates change, it speeds up warming. You get more global warming and they call that a positive feedback. Over here, they say global warming also creates change that slows down warming and they call that a negative feedback. And they say this one's faster and this one's slower. Now. Um, when we look at this, it, um, the, the variable, if we wanted to try to label the links here, I hope we can see the variables kind of create challenges here. So they kind of violate some of our CLD rules. So like what's wrong with some of these variables that are in this kind of CLD? The same, same one occurs twice, creates change, creates change, that's in both places. Other sort of basic things about our rules for um, what are some of our main rules for, for creating variable names? Yeah. So they have these action words. So they're not noun phrases, right? So they're, they're kind of telling a sequence of events. Um, but um, they, so we'd like to maybe try to just remove those action words. But if we just remove the verbs, it doesn't really help much, right? So like, this becomes change and change, and that becomes warming and warming. So simply, you know, removing the action words doesn't give us the specificity to really communicate, you know, what's going on here. So that's what we'd like to do is try to build um, a, uh, a causal loop diagram that maybe makes sense here. So can we think of some things that we can put um, in these boxes? So um, let me see if... Um, Oh, and I see in the chat, speeds up implies direction. So yeah, that's like, yeah, that's an example of a problem there. So I'm going to verify that I can do this. Let me try what, see what happens when I draw. Hey, I can draw. Okay, good. So, um, so what are some ideas either um, uh, from online or from in the, in the room for um, what I might label? Let's say if we focus on the warming reinforcing loop over here, we've already kind of done this, but we have ideas for what might go in one of these three boxes. Anybody? Yeah. Yep. Global temperature. I like that. That sounds good. So um, I'm going to part of my scribble here. But I could say global temperature. Um, and maybe I'll change the color here for these others. Um, what about then? So that's global. Or maybe I'll just write global global temp. So any other thoughts on other um, ones of these boxes? Like, let's say if that's global temperature, then um, what might be up here or down here? Yeah. So uh, we do CO2 concentrations, that would, uh, that would be, or, or just GH, so, some sort of greenhouse gas concentrations could be up here. And so if you had um, greenhouse gas concentrations, then um, if we were looking for, um, you know, what, what else goes on here, we'd have to sort of think, what's that story? Um, does we have a, another thing we could put there that you know, as you increase greenhouse gas concentrations, is what, what, how does that lead back to global temperatures? What's the story there? So um, 
For one, is there a causal link between temperature and greenhouse gas concentrations? Can we justify that? So as temperature goes up, why does that increase greenhouse gas concentrations? Maybe that's an easier one. Maybe I should instead erase, um, which I think I can do. Let me try this guy. So let's put, I'm going to put GHGs down here. G, if it'll let me stick with that, G, H, G concentrations. So that's what I'm putting in this bottom box. So um, can we think of um, what, um, so if we get a, what would cause greenhouse gas concentrations? How, how do we link temperature to greenhouse gas concentrations? Anybody thought, was that a hand or that was just a pen? Okay. Like, no, 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 I'm just saying, what, if I put GHDs, how is causally, how are global temperatures, um, how do global temperatures lead to an increase in greenhouse gas concentrations? What's the causal mechanism? Yeah, I need both. I, I can do this, I think, but I, I need to know what, how I get, yeah. Yeah, so like permafrost melting or something like that. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's not a bad one. So I can put permafrost up here. So, um, so this, you know, this thought here would be, and we can now label the links, but the thought here is that global temperatures are going to affect the permafrost. And as the permafrost uh, levels change, then stored up greenhouse gases will be released which will, we could draw additional uh, stops here, but that is going to uh, lead to other processes that may then further increase global temperatures. Well, so don't you have, because that's a natural system, don't you have to have another one? Uh, well, you could, you absolutely could have um, out here, another box that so says that like human. Bigger than the fact that you know, uh, you're saying because of, I mean, humans release more greenhouse gases than the natural process. Right. Well, I'm not looking for the only uh, positive feedback here. Yeah, but there, would, you, would you consider the external uh, human activity? Yeah, I, I would because um, if. Because otherwise, if you're saying that uh, it, it was participating in the feedback loop, then we'd be saying that, and there might be a link here, we just need to justify it, that global temperatures, like let's just say, um, you know, we'd have to say, is it justifiable to have that link or a sequence of uh, steps that lead to that where global temperature increases human activity? Now, there might be a narrative where as it gets hotter, the struggle to stay cool ends up leading to more greenhouse gas. So we start you know, running our ACs more and our ACs ultimately are fueled by fossil fuels, which leads to more greenhouse gas. That's totally reasonable. In fact, we could have made that um, these two boxes. Like we could have said global temperatures increases energy use, which increases greenhouse gas, which increases global temperatures. And so that would have been a perfectly fine way to do too. But we've had to, there's a bunch of different options that we could put here. Um, if we're just focusing on the permafrost link, then um, we'd say, well, um, what can get this engine going is an exogenous input from human activity taken off the greenhouse gases that can then start this going. Animal die off is going to be there, there are. You can we this this should be again. This is one example. This isn't all of the feedbacks, but there is a complex network here where we can come up with lots of different reinforcing loops, some that can contribute to each other, some that are independent. Um, I'm just looking at the moment for one example of positive a positive feedback here. And one of those is this permafrost uh, link. There, 
can be other mechanisms. Like, for example, I think the, the one that I sort of had in mind is the default, which relates to what we did before, was global temperature is going to have some effect on ice, which is going to have some effect on albedo. And so that is a, a separate set, a separate positive feedback loop. So we could come up with a lot of these positive feedback loops, some that interact with each other, some that are just in parallel with each other. So, um, but that's kind of getting just looking for one right now to practice and coming up with nouns that help communicate a mechanism that produces a positive feedback. So now that I got both of them up there, I might as well just leave both of them up there and then we can label all of these links. And so um, if, if we're going the permafrost pathway, as we get increased global temperatures, what happens to the permafrost? Does it go down or up? How many people say down? And I'll look online as well. How many people say up? Right, so most people I think were saying that it goes down. So higher temperatures melt the permafrost. So that is an opposite relationship. Or if you could say, if you increase this, you decrease that, that decrease means we're gonna put a minus for that little question mark. And I could now also do the upper link. So as I increase temperatures, similar idea, what happens to glacier ice? Same idea, it's also gonna go down. Does so everybody see that? So both of those are minuses. Now, if I'm going around the permafrost here, I have to figure out how to label uh, this thing um, down here. I don't know if I got a pointer on here. What happens with this? Whoa, that's not what I want. Um, so um, I need to figure out how to label this one right here. So here I'm saying if I were to increase permafrost, what happens to greenhouse gas concentrations? So think about this, if I increase permafrost, I add more permafrost, or if I imagine myself in a world where there was more permafrost today, would there be more or less greenhouse gas? That's what we're really sort of saying. So if I increase permafrost, what happens to GHGs? So this would be a minus or a plus. How many people think this should be a minus? How many people say it should be a plus? Okay, a couple minuses, a couple pluses. Um, so for me, it seems to me, if I think about the mechanisms that, or I could go the other way, if I decrease permafrost, I'm going to increase GHGs because it's if I melt the permafrost, the GHGs go into the air as they're, they were sequestered under the permafrost, in the permafrost, now they're in the air. So by decreasing permafrost, I increase GHGs. That to me is an opposite relationship. So I would put a minus here. Any questions about that? People buy that that's a... I've got a question about because when we talk about shifts of states, because if you move the permafrost to the right, then the shifts of states there would be no impact. Again, this is a partial, this you have to consider, um, relative to the no change baseline. So this isn't about, um, I, it's not a path dependent sort of thing. It's sort of the saying, I'm in a snapshot of how things are now in the world. And if I were to decrease things from, so now is the baseline. So if I were to imagine um, what is a version of now with decreased permafrost, it would be a version where all the GHCs that were in the permafrost can't be there anymore, so they're in the air. Now, it's a little more confusing when you think the other way about, well, if I'm, you know, if my baseline is a certain level of permafrost, how do I go the other way? Well, we're not simply layering on permafrost. You just have to sort of imagine that if I somehow arrived in the world now with more permafrost than it has at the current moment, then one would imagine if there's a certain amount of sequestration density ability of the permafrost, that if I could have more of it, that I would have less GHG. So we focus on, in these links, we hold everything else, um, we try to hold all of the other effects constant to say that if we have the same amount of GHGs everywhere in the air and in the permafrost, if I had more permafrost and I maintain the same sort of density of sequestration, then I, the GHGs would shift to being more in the permafrost than in the air.
So it's trying to capture the differential effect with everything else being constant. Yeah, but there's some cognitive things. And the reason I say that is because if you were to use this as a system today, that's what you call it. If the idea was to simply, you know, so that's really perfect for us to do the whole term. Because if you wanted to actually have an impact and we were getting to the point where the permafrost was decreasing, then we would have to actively move bio well, that's fine. material to sequester it. Sure. You know, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I got it, got it. I, I, I don't want to get too much caught in the forest um, or caught in the trees and away from the forest here. Is that um, the idea here is that to your point, all of your variables to your stakeholders should be, you should be able to defend them. If you cannot defend the mechanism to your particular stakeholder, you may need to get more specific. And you may need to sort of say uh, that, well, this is exactly what I mean by this causal link. And so um, if we just put you know, a very generic word, it becomes sort of difficult. I'm a little limited in space. And I'm sort of coming up with an example, which is the reason why, you know, using permafrost is sort of a simple example here. Um, is it the best example? There probably are better examples. Like I said, the ice example is a little easier for us to work through. But if we stick with the GHGs, this is one example that I hope you at least see the method here. Um, you need to be able to defend the link. If the link is not defensible, then we can rephrase, think of, well, maybe there's a, a slightly better term that gets at what we're saying. But I at least can tell you that we can dynamically capture the effect that we do know that if you melt the permafrost as it currently is relative to baseline, you will increase to some extent the amount of GHGs, which is why there's a minus there. Does that satisfy? All right. So, and then going from the ice to the albedo, similar idea. We have to say if we increase the ice, what happens to the albedo? If we decrease the ice, what happens to the albedo? Now, albedo is reflectiveness. So this is a slightly different story than the permafrost. So um, remember, ice is white, water is blue. White's more reflective. So if we increase ice, um, how many people think we increase reflective, reflectivity? Okay. If we decrease ice, um, then we decrease reflectivity. So, um, so in this case, for this downward link, I would actually put um, a plus because they move in the same direction. Does everybody see that? That from ice to albedo, that's a plus. Okay, now we have to say um, that, um, you know, it was finished both of these loops. And I like putting the, both of these loops together because they're gonna contrast in the way the links line up, but the loops are gonna match in loop polarity. So. If I go from GHG concentration to global temperatures, if I increase the greenhouse gases in the air, how many people think I increase the temperatures? Okay, so that's most everybody. Okay, so that's what that's I get. So from GHG to global temperatures, that to me is a plus. But then from albedo, if I increase reflectivity, then um, the opposite thing happens. So with more reflectivity over time, global temperatures come down. So the albedo to global temperatures is actually gonna be a minus. So maybe see if I can uh, get this a little closer. So I'll use maybe, a, I'll just try to get it right here. All right, so this red one is a plus but this blue one is a minus. So everybody see that that's a minus from reflectivity to temperature. Increase reflectivity, decrease temperature, so they're opposite. So it's, I think that's pretty interesting because now if I look, I have two negative links going around here. I have two negative links going around here. They both have an even number of negative links, which is why this is a reinforcing loop. They're both reinforcing loops, but they have a different structure in the kind of the sequence of the way this thing is lined up. So it just goes to show that you can have very different link structures around the loops, but the loop polarities will be the same. In that homework assignment, where you're drawing the two kidney-shaped regions for the VHS versus Betamax, that'll be a similar idea. 
where both of those kidneys will have the same looped polarity, but they'll have a different set of links. So, um, so that goes to show that the loops are really driving everything. They're the salient features. The links in particular, um, each individual link matters, but when you put them all together, the bigger picture kind of transcends all the peculiarities of the links. So the point is here there, we could have come up with a lot of different reinforcing loops, and we often do when we talk about global warming. But um, Met Office's point here was that there is a balancing loop that goes on here. It just happens to be a little slower, or there are several balancing loops that go on with global warming. So does anybody, uh, can, anybody can think of um, a balancing loop here? We hardly ever talk about the negative feedbacks in, in climate change, but there are some. Carbon yeah, carbon sequesters, how does that work? Any, any thoughts? No, no, but I mean, if we were to sort of say, what are the processes, the dynamical, the variables involved? Um, how do we get, like carbon sequestration could be the name of this loop. What are some variables that are involved in that, that we could label up here and down here? So as global temperatures rise, um, what do we get more of? Yeah. Um, I like the general idea. So the question the comment was like maybe photosynthesis. And so, yeah, that is, that's, that's one great, that we could do that. That's not, the, that, so that's, we'll say that um, by, by me putting photosynthesis here, I'm gonna just say photosyn, we're just saying that there's hard to read that, but that's supposed to be photosynthesis up here. So we're just saying that there is more activity, more growth, basically more tree growth. And so if there's more photosynthesis here, maybe we have more plant matter, you know, down here. And so, um, so that pathway, if you think about it, global temperatures, and I'll just sort of for for every rule, global temperatures maybe increases photosynthesis. Photosynthesis increases plant matter, which is going to suck up more carbon. As plant matter sucks up more carbon, then um, through processes like we probably could actually link this at this point way over to you know the GHG concentration. So. It just so happens the way we drew this that we imagine these as independent loops, but we could have drawn plant matter over to GHGs and back. But we'll just forget that we wrote GHGs here for the moment. And we'll say plant matter, if you increase plant matter, we will ultimately, through GHGs, decrease global temperature. And now we have an odd number of negative links and that's a balancing loop. So that's one example, and I'll have another example in the next slide, but does that example make sense? We increase temperatures. Um, if we can justify this link that photosynthesis operates better at higher temperatures, that we can, then we can get this uh, balancing feedback to work. Now we would have to talk to a plant physiologist to make sure that this link makes sense. They might tell us that actually um, the, whatever the Calvin cycle is less effective at certain temperatures and so, you know, once you get out of an optimum, then it slows things down and the plants don't grow as well or something along those lines. But this is at least a theory we have of how this might work. So any, any thoughts about that? Any, does it make sense? All right, so let's... those all could be added just like the bird feeder example so you know we can we can add all of those things in and the the point is that if we know that all things if, if you hold all the cloud cover uh uh constant then we could sort of say well what happens if you increase global temperatures then you could say okay but then now what if uh how does global temperature affect cloud cover and then so you could have another box up here for cloud cover how does cloud cover affect these things so the idea here is you want to peel away the onion one piece at a time. And so you can say, holding cloud cover equal, what happens? Holding everything else equal, how does cloud cover affect? How does cloud cover affect those things? It's only after we layer all those things in, then we get the big picture. Um, and so we wanna take things apart, the smallest bit by smallest bit, 
and then let the system's tools assemble those things. Because if we try to do that, then we run the risk of our mental models jumping over steps. So that's what we're trying to get at here. Now, for me, this is the way I drew this. Um, I did ice and albedo, like we talked about. Uh, but I did um, chemical weathering and biosequestration in shells, which to me was a very slow feedback process, where the idea here is that um, as you get more global temperature, you get more uh, thermodynamic activity, so you get more chemical weathering. And so chemical weathering um, ends up sending a lot more carbon down into the ocean, which allows them to form into shells, and that biosequestration ultimately will lower the global temperature. And if I have GHGs, again, I could have biosequestration in shells, reduces GHGs, and then that would end up reducing global temperature. So that was my example, um, just because I wanted something that really showed a fast, relatively fast link or loop, and a really uh, relatively slow loop over here. Well, to me, biosequestration in shells takes a long amount of time. So just because you've now um, made the carbon available, um, to me, I would say that probably is going to have the delay link there um, because that actual synthesis process is gonna take a while. And then this might also have a delay too, um, but, um, but yeah, I think these two links down here are probably slower than this one up here. But overall, I think all three of these links are slower than these three links. Okay, so that's just one example. So any questions about that example? Notice the, I mean, we already did this one, minus plus minus, um, here plus plus minus. So increased temperature, increased weathering, increased weathering, increased biosequestration, increased temperature. Questions online, if we have at least one online. Okay, so, but the point we're trying to get at here is that when we back out and think about the whole feedback system, so we have to, you know, so much of the literature that we see, especially in the public media about climate change focuses only on the warming link. And that there might be good reasons for that. But if you only communicate the warming loop, then you open yourself up for rhetorical, uh, basically a, a rhetorical liability, because someone's gonna say, wait a second, there's nothing grows to the sky, there's always a balancing loop. And so then we have to say, okay, fair point, let's back out and think about all the balancing things. So just like we were doing there, we could think about a bunch of different things that might contribute to warming, and we can contribute, think about a bunch of different things that might contribute to cooling. And once we've accounted for all the ones that we can think of, then I think we're still going to find that all the ones over here that are balancing are way slower than all the ones over here that are warming. And they're so much slower that for the timescales of human activity, these almost are like non-existent, right? And so that's the reason why we typically only publicize the vicious cycle here, the positive feedback loop. But we need to, as systems thinkers, make sure that we are you know being honest with everyone that we have accounted for everything and um, and that again makes our helps us communicate these ideas more clearly um, and makes it not seem like we're sort of coming up with these sort of fictitious uh sky is falling examples and so the the point here is that there's you never ever see a purely reinforcing feedback loop it's generally the case that anything that grows eventually is going to be limited. And that's just, I mean, it's, it's, that's a generalization. It might be an overgeneralization. There might be some abstract quantities that we can think of, but usually you run up against conservation of matter or energy or whatever that's going to eventually limit the cycle. And, um, and this is the case even with global temperature. Now, that doesn't mean that this saves us from climate change because you know, if we actually understand the time scale here, if we take this and put it into a simulator, then we might say, you know, we've got a simulator calibrated to everything we know about the earth. And yeah, it does level off like this, but it's after whatever, 3000 years or something like that. And so, and when it levels off, we're in an ice age or, you know, something like, so 
like we end up having a more realistic idea about this leveling off as opposed to this qualitative idea that everything's just going to get better. So we so it's important for us to recognize that reinforcing loops are usually reinforcing early in time and eventually there's a balancing loop and that combination of reinforcing plus balancing is this so-called archetype that we would refer to as S-shaped growth, logistic growth, sigmoidal growth, sigmoid meaning S-shaped, then uh, that, you know, that we have to sort of recognize. So this is our first kind of example of a systems archetype of trying to take one loop, combining it with another, and, um, and then getting more interesting dynamics out of it. All right, so any questions about this example? That there always are these links, these limiting processes, and we need to make sure we're honest about ourselves and include them. So what we're getting into in this unit is for how to build from one loop, like the positive feedback loop we always advertise, we're trying to get people excited about climate change, to more realistic systems that have usually two more or more, like a lot more loops. And we use these in two directions. We either um, go from observable behavior through time to likely causal loops. So we might look at weird, uh, behaviors over time and try to say what's going on there well you know and, and we start thinking well you notice when it, it, it kind of rises and then falls and what are systems that we kind of know about that sort of model systems that kind of behave like that and then that helps us maybe start in our models we can go the other way though too somebody can give us a description of the all the dynamical behaviors in the system and then we can look at it and we can say oh wow you know before i even run this system before i even you know go out and experiment with the system i can tell there's a really strong uh, archetype of this here. There's another strong archetype of this here. So I would expect to see these behaviors over time. So we can go in both directions here. That's what we're kind of getting into. And so these are some of the simplest archetypes that have come out of a chapter five of the book here. So I just want to walk through them, at least some of these, to give us kind of an idea of where we're going. And so like simple example here is like oscillations. A lot of systems have oscillations. And where do oscillations generally come from? Well, there is uh, this archetype of a balancing feedback loop with a strong delay um, that uh, tends to lead to oscillation. So we know that in the shower example, um, if you make the delay really large, then it's possible to get um, an almost sustained oscillation as someone, if that person doesn't dynamically update in their head and realize that this oscillation is happening if they're simply responding to the temperature of the water then it's easy to get an oscillation so if we note i um if we draw a causal loop diagram and we see a balancing feedback with delay we know that we might have be at risk for oscillations likewise if we see oscillations we might need to say is there a, a link here that is significantly slower than all of the other links and if it is, maybe that's why we're getting these boom and bust cycles. Um, this has come up a lot recently talking about supply chains um, in COVID and post COVID um, because of all of these chokes, these choke points in the supply chain network that create these delays. So, you know, it's going to take you a couple of months to get inventory in. So you order way more inventory than you need. Uh, so um, that inventory takes a couple months to get there. By the time it gets there, then people don't want that product anymore. So then the prices go down. And then suddenly people really like that the prices are down. So they buy up all that stuff again. And then you're in the same cycle again. And that's all because that we had to overcompensate for this really long lead time that was in the supply chain network. And so that's kind of a liability that's generated by delays in one part of a system being so much larger than delays in other parts. So that's something we want to look out for. We can, um, you know, we already talked also about S-shaped growth, you know, so um, that's, go back, sorry about that. So um, so we talked about this one. This was, um, I think I might've had this example before with, well, at least I had the chickens and eggs before, but you know, like, you know, uh, you can't have chickens go to infinity. And so there's gotta be limiting processes with chickens. And according to the, the old joke, um, you know, the, the more chickens you have, the more road crossings and that eventually, you know, limits the number of chickens. And so you've always got that limiting cycle here. Um, this other kind of narrative story about the boy who cried wolf um, also sort of suggests that there is some feedback process that makes the boy want to cry wolf more, but it's limited by the process of the townspeople 
not paying attention to the wolf anymore or the boy anymore and ultimately limited by the boy's survival um, with the wolf. Now, this is not a particularly good um, uh, causal loop diagram, given that um, you know townspeople find no wolf, like it, it, it doesn't describe actions, but I threw it in there because somebody drew it in Vinsim. And so I just to show you, look, people use Vinsim that's out there. But the point I'm trying to get as, um, you know, S-shaped growth, it typically is what you, you know, reinforcing growth typically doesn't grow to the sky. Like I said before, it's usually followed by balancing. I juxtapose those together because you often combine the two of them. So you can have S-shaped growth, but then the balancing feedback loop can have delay. And that growth with overshoot um, is a really common archetype that explains, for example, in the limits to growth model, um, this human activity collapse here that came from um, a balancing feedback loop uh, with delay that limited a reinforcing loop where the delay was very large. That's what led to in uh, Forrester's model for the limits to growth, this collapse. And it's kind of like that supply chain issue because of the delay in the balancing feedback, there was a major overconsumption. And then by the time it limited growth, there weren't enough resources for the old population numbers to sustain, which led to a collapse. So these things where you see these rapid collapses often come from having a growth loop with its limiting balancing loop, but those limits um, being uh, felt after some delay so that you can actually overconsume consume uh, before the limits kick in. So again, this is like, if you see this in a system that you ever run a risk of this, or if you see this on a behavior over time, you can look back and again, look for the delays because it's often the delays that are the things that create these collapses. Think about the fisheries case. I mean, that was sort of a similar example where the reduction in density did not lead to a reduction in catch until it was too late. And at that point, uh, the density was so low that old levels of catch could not be sustained. So it's an example of how these archetypes give us a lens on which to look at behaviors over time. They also allow us to take behaviors over time and, and then build plausible models. And so this is effectively the model that was embedded in Forrester's um, over here. Does that make sense what I mean by that? Is we're, we're embellishing these simple causal loop diagrams and with these minor embellishments, we start getting more and more complex behaviors out. Okay. Questions on that, that seem clear. All right, so that's kind of where we're going um, in, um, in this uh, section. And we're gonna be starting to read this Kim and Lannan article which goes over about eight or nine of the sort of the common sort of systems archetypes some of these you've probably seen in 220 those of you who took 220 um but it sort of brings us all up to speed if you haven't and um and there's a, a, a lot of sort of general ideas about from that article about how to make your um how to make your uh your uh, causal loop diagrams more and more realistic more and more complex and so Along those lines, sort of the, the same place where I got that Kim and Lannan article has this nice um, decision uh, tree that I've, I think, included on the back of the homework assignment that is a, a release today that um, has all of the archetypes from the Kim and Lannan um, built up and sort of how they relate to each other. And this helps us uh, develop a way in which we can build ever more complex CLDs, starting with simple things and then going up. So, as an example, um, up here, we have, I, have I am concerned about, well, if your research question you're studying is concerned about growth, before you do, do anything else, you say, well, what, what is it, what's the thing powering the growth? And so that's going to be a simple reinforcing loop. Vicious and virtuous spirals go into there. So I probably need to find something that is going to generate growth, like population growth. And so I just have a simple loop. Um, but then I have to remember nothing grows forever. So then like we did in the weather example or the climate example, I have to sort of think, um, well, what ultimately is gonna limit this growth? Cause nothing grows, you know, it keeps growing forever. So then I have to add in 
that limitation. So try to think about what other things are fueling it and what happens when the fuel runs out. And, um, and then you can think, well, if I'm in uh, sort of a human process, if um, I might imagine that someone might want, if, if ultimately I'm capacity limited, then I could imagine a feedback loop that tries to grow the capacity in order to try to keep up so I can keep the growth going. So I might imagine this feedback loop here, which is a little hard to see here, but it's basically got a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop, which is our standard one, but then another balancing loop that where this balancing loop, this here is where the capacity is. And so the idea here is you can have a separate um, capacity trying to grow your capacity, but what often happens when you set up these systems is there can be an underinvestment. And um, if you have an underinvestment in your capacity growth, then you can get a different sort of set of dynamics. And so it, it kind of draws, you know, you started out with, I was just concerned with growth. I had to get by limitations. And then I could imagine someone trying to use an additional energy to reduce the limitations. And so this is a way in which we guide our thinking toward adding in things that we may have forgotten of. So this is just generally a, a pattern in which we can try to add variables in starting from the simplest concerns and getting more complex. On the flip side of that, uh, so this is, I think I just have an example here, my growing action, um, I, uh, I've got a performance limitation that's gonna prevent me from growing to forever. And then I've got, um, I'm trying to increase my performance limitation with some performance standard, but I might end up having an underinvestment, and, uh, and that's kind of, again, this pattern that's going through here. Now I can um, flip that around and say, well, what if I'm not interested in growing? The other common problems we solve are fixing problems. Well, if you're focused on fixing problems, you should always start with a balancing loop. So if it's not growth, if it's about bringing things back to normal, then you've got a balancing loop. But the balancing loop you drew, um, if you wanna sort of try to think about, are there side effects? You can then sort of say, will the fix that I've implemented in my balancing loop come back to haunt me? And so what that would mean is that there might be a reinforcing loop that's hidden behind the balancing loop. So the example here is that, you know, I have a cash flow problem. Well, what's one way to solve a cash flow problem? If that's what I'm trying to think, well, I could borrow money. That's an easy way to solve a cash flow problem in the short term. So that is a balancing loop. Cash flow problem, same. So this is a plus. A borrowing, borrowing opposite, that's a minus. So borrowing reduces the cash flow problem. But I've not included all of the variables that are out there. If you really think about it, not when you do borrowing, that's not only going to affect your cash flow problem, it's also going to introduce a new variable in the system, interest payments. Interest payments initially are not going to be very big, but if you continue this pattern, um, borrowing gives you more interest payments, which lead to more cash flow problems, which lead to more borrowing. So it's a hidden reinforcement loop. So whenever you draw a balancing loop, if you're trying to figure out, you know, did I include everything? You need to sort of think about, are there additional variables I can add that might, for example, have introduced a reinforcing loop? And then I could say, well, then, you know, if I want to try to figure out what the right solution was, then I can say, well, uh, I'm not getting at the underlying cause. Um, so the example here was here's my cash flow problem that I had normally. Here's my interest payment. So this little egg shaped thing here is just this thing turned on its side. Now, um, what we're saying here is that the real solution I maybe should have implemented were financial controls. So this cash flow problem, this was maybe the, the right solution. Um, but what I see is not only is my solution generating this second problem through interest, but it's also reducing the efficacy of the real solution. So that's this loose spending mortality and that adds another reinforcing loop. So we can see that um, we've gone from a relatively simple balancing loop that's, um, that is, you know, leaves out a lot. And through a, a tree like this that we can get practice at, we can trickle in variables that help us direct our attention towards the other important things we need to consider in financial planning, 
um, including maybe the right solution and the challenges to that solution. And so we can kind of build a tree to help us get there. So, um, so that's kind of an example of this way of thinking of being able to try to move from one archetype to another. A lot of these archetypes, um, they, we ultimately land in these archetypes that have these funny names like shifting the burden. We never wonder how we got there. This tree, for most of these archetypes, if I were to go back and show the whole tree, um, it has the big archetypes at its leaves of this tree, tragedy of the commons, attractiveness principle, accidental adversaries, we heard about that one last time, growth, um, growth and underinvestment, uh, escalation. So these are all ones we've talked about. Um, they don't come up out of nowhere. They came up from thinking about how do you start from a simple loop and what are different ways to trickle in additional things that might matter. And it turns out that once you get out to the leaves of this tree, a lot of the big problems that we see in dynamical systems are expressed by some form of these leaves. And so that's what we're getting at in the Kim and Landon paper that we're reading. So that's a motivation for what we're doing here. And like I said, this is pretty rich. All of these are represented somewhere on here. So these are the ones that Moorcroft says are fundamental. And these I'm claiming are even um, additional ones that we should be considering that include these plus a few more. And if you go, I think Wikipedia even has a system archetype page. And I think they list most of these. Um, they might have a, one or two more. Um, but I think they pretty much have all of these on here. All right, so questions about, about this. This is just motivation, and you're going to read out the archetypes next time, but, um, but at least when you sort of see what I mean by archetypes and how they're kind of these clusters of feedback loops that have their own interesting peculiarities. Online. All right, so, uh huh. It strikes me that uh, balance of these is probably the closest to a foundational philosophy that we see in the Because, um, I mean, what else would sustainability be about but interventions that are able to create forms of stability? Uh, well, I'd say they're both important. So, for example, virtuous cycles are another thing. So, if you can get people to um, engage in a new activity that they haven't engaged in yeah, before. Well, because of the state of the world in so many different systems, right now we need to focus more on balance and force. And well, the other thing is, is that it, 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 it's kind of you're making an assumption that when you're going through the cycle, the state of the system is, is stable. But it's not. I mean, history tells us that pretty much any system is going to go through perturbations that are going to shift it into a different state, and different mechanisms come into play until ultimately. The goal of, I mean, like I say, 99% of everything that's ever lived, if you're talking about. Yeah, okay. I, I see where you're going for all that. But, but, for, but I guess I, I've never said anything about assuming stability. And, um, and as we will see as we get further on in the semester, um, these, uh, these are representing dynamical relationships, but we can perturb them through the exogenous channels. And as we'll see, like in unit G, that we can um, talk about moving systems from one fixed point into another. We'll talk about things like tipping points. We'll talk about things like chaos and all those will eventually come. But generally these, um, even though I'm saying that, you know, like for example, that that's not a stable point right there, a simple reinforcing loop. But, um, but even these steady state behaviors here, um, we're saying that these, these, what I call limit cycles. So this is a fixed point. This is a limit cycle these exist in the systems we're not saying that they're globally stable we're saying that if you recognize this behavior this particular limit cycle or fixed point um, is uh, can be generated by these dynamical relationships but it is possible that these dynamical relationships ex especially if they've got um, in, um, interactions from more complex feedbacks on the side can be shifted into other modes. And so that um, there can be canalization where um, you can start out with not knowing what type of system you're in. And over time you get canalized into one type of dynamics. It's almost as if all the other loops fall away and, uh, it's, and it can be very difficult to get out of that canal, um, but, uh, but you can start out with a lot of potential. So all that is there, I promise, um, but it's, um, but the idea here is we're just trying to show the potential that, that 
um, even if one system has the ability to generate multiple different uh, modes, um, there are certain modes that are really only associated with certain types of systems. Okay. All right, so let's see uh, So where we're going to today here. So you said there's this, um, uh, there's this reading for um, the next lecture on Tuesday. It's this Kim and Lannan article on, uh, so this is not out of your book, but it's uh, distributed online uh, again, but it's got the same reading uh, uh, triplets. And the, um, the other thing that we're gonna start working on here, so, so some of that we had a muddiest point, um, do uh, before the next lecture, um, like I said, the reading assignments, and then um, today we're assigning this assignment C1. It is not due this Sunday, it's due next Sunday. A relatively simple assignment, um, but um, but it does require you to use either Insight Maker or Vincent to draw some CLDs. Relatively simple ones, and that's what we're starting today. And so, um, what I want you to do here is, um, in the next, you know, we've got a couple of minutes on this one and a couple of minutes on the next one. Um, I think most people here are are in the room. So, in your sort of small groups, you can kind of do in the tables here. Either you could work. It doesn't have to be paper, but I try to make it so that if we did have people online, there would be ways to do that. So um, I've got a Google Sheet uh, where you can draw and work together on it. And that way you've got it archived for later, because whatever you develop here in class, you can feel free to use on your homework. But all I'm asking you to do in this first um, activity is to just build a causal loop diagram with a shaped growth. So um, it's uh, so if we had, I, I might skip this part too, just to and and to make this a little bit smoother. But I just uh, want us uh, to come up with S-shaped growth, and so basically a reinforcing loop coupled with a balancing loop that would generate S-shaped growth. And so nominally, uh, I've done this in the past where I'd have you draw um, uh, the the CLDs without labels and then trade. But I think for time. Um, I'm just going to give you sort of, it says almost everybody is in class. Um, I'm just going to sort of say what we'll do next. And you can kind of work on this fluidly. And so this is your first challenge is to draw a causal loop diagram for S-shaped growth. And then the second challenge, and again, these are match up to uh, things you'll be doing on the homework assignment that you can then use this, is look at this drifting goals archetype that I've put on the assignment. Um, and also, if you go to uh, this activity link, you'll be able to find it, or if you just go to the homework assignment, and I describe the way drifting goals work, and it's two balancing feedback loops linked by a, a sort of a belt in the middle, but this is not escalation, so that's kind of the key thing here. This drifting goals, if you read the description or the example here, you'll see it behaves very differently than escalation, even though it's two balancing feedback loops. I want you to try to come up with an example of drifting goals. And, um, and then, you know, the, the rest is just work on the C1 submissions. And so um, these are going to be related to your assignment C1. Um, and that's all I've kind of got planned for the rest of the day. So we've got you know, about 15, 20 minutes left. So with your groups, um, feel free to work on these two. Um, I'll see if I can put both of these links up on the screen at once um, in case you want to make use of the Google Sheets. So that's um, all I've got for any questions about that. 